Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Season 2, Episode number 15 of The Music Spring. This is the 6th of August, 2014. Please let me welcome your host to The Music Spring, Lisa Farr. Hey, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of The Music Spring. I'm so excited about today. Uh, we're talking in a genre that I'm releasing music in, uh, so this is very relevant to me as an artist and uh, relevant to what's happening in the in the greater scape of the music business. Uh, EDM, electronic dance music, is to the next two decades, uh, I believe and a lot of my colleagues believe, that it is to the next two decades what alternative rock was to the 90s and the early noughties. Um, artists today like Dead Mouse and Avicii and Tiesto and Armin Van Buren, Flume, these are the equivalent of bands like Pearl Jam and uh, Nirvana, Silverchair in the 90s and the early noughties. Um, so today, today we want to look at the difference between the genres that are evolving right now and why EDM is so relevant and how it as a model is so different to all the traditional music business and what that means for music business going forward. And joining me today, we have Neil Ackland in Australia. Hey, Neil. Hello. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. And we have Matthew Adele in California. Hey, Matt. Hi. Matt, let's start with you. Why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about who you are and what you've been up to and what's going on? Sure. I, I recently was the CEO of Beatport. I stepped down a handful of weeks ago. I'm enjoying some time at home raising a new puppy. <laughs> and prior to that, I've been in the digital music business since the first internet bubble with companies like legal, the legal version of Napster, Amazon, Music Now. I worked in early uh, internet radio products, and before that I was in di independent dance music. Mm -hmm. I worked at a really influential label when I was a kid called Wax Tracks Records that was responsible for a lot of industrial dance music in the United States, and where I was lucky enough to sign an act called the KLF. And then I was driven to start an independent label in Chicago back in the day where I was fortunate enough, really blessed, to work with Derek Carter from mm -hmm. Chicago and Sunshine and Moonbeam from Dub Tribe Sound System in San Francisco. Uh, so getting to Beatport was really a, like returning to my first love, uh, dance music. And I'm happy to see so many people excited about dance music now. Yeah. It's, uh, for anyone who hasn't encountered Matthew Adele, um, and, and I'm not going to, I'm not trying to make you gush here. I, I've been a huge fan of Matt's ever since I saw him at South by Southwest in 2008 for the first time. There was this guy sitting on a panel that was from Napster and had this curly hair and these glasses on. I'm like, there's something about this guy. And, and then when I heard him speak, I have, I, I rarely see people as passionate as Matt about music that are doing as much as they fucking can to get the best music into the right people's hands. So uh, we're very honoured to have you on the show. Um, and next I'm going to hand over to Neil. Neil, again, someone who I'm so excited to have on the show because as an entrepreneur, I think you're really setting the standard for the way that music business is going to head in the future. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what In The Mix is and, and how it's shaping uh, digital media for the music business. Sure. Um, okay, so my story, I'm actually from the UK. Uh, I came to Australia in 1998 and um, my sort of teenage years and, and early 20s were spent going to to raves in, uh, in fields in, in places around the UK and uh, going to clubs in London and, and, and very much uh, my very early music experiences were around dance music in, in the UK. When I came to Australia in 98, there wasn't there wasn't much of a scene here. It was it was here, but it was it was relatively small. I was very passionate about it, and uh, I wanted to find a way to 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 make a career out of it and kind of break into this space. And at the same time, uh, I was uh, I was just discovering uh, uh, digital media and the internet, and and uh, I was really excited about the kind of combination of these two things. Uh, and I met up with a couple of guys who were working on a very early. Uh, phase website called In The Mix 
and um, it seemed like this incredible um, opportunity. And it was kind of like I would describe it as social media before the term social media had even yeah. been invented. Um, and um, there was a there was a small community kind of bubbling up in Australia, and um, they were connecting using this this um, medium, this platform within the mix. And uh, I knew straight away that that's what I wanted to do, and I, I threw all my spare time at it, and um, and we began working on it in the weekends and in the evenings to try and and figure out this thing and, and really trying to get our head around what it could become, what it could be. Uh, and back then it was very embryonic; it was it really was a hobby. Um, we we never really envisaged that it could become uh, a business. But then as time went on into sort of 2001. Uh, 2002, it really started to, to take off and, and scale in terms of audience, and that's when we realised that there was potentially there was a way that we might actually be able to make a living out of this thing, and uh, give up our shitty day jobs that we all hated. <laughs> uh, and then eventually, I got fired from my day job because my boss pulled me into a room and said, "What are you doing? Like, you, you seem to be really distracted, and and uh, you're not doing much work." And I said, "No, I'm." I'm doing this amazing thing. I have to tell you about it. And she said, "That's awesome. You're fired." And I was like, oh, <laughs> um, "Time to time to uh, go and, and figure out how much you're going to make this thing work." And then we started to turn it into a business um, around then, and you know, going and knocking on people's doors, trying to say, "Hey, you know, the, the internet um, bubbles just burst, and how about you come and buy some banner ads on on our website?" And everybody thought I was crazy. Yeah. But it was fun. It was it was actually probably the most exciting time in uh, in my career and, and probably in my life because it was so fresh and so new. You know, you wake up in the morning and you you just have no idea what that day is going to bring to you. And you put your feet on the ground and you're literally bouncing out of bed with excitement because it was so new and so fresh. You know, the 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 music was new. The 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 medium of the internet was completely fresh and new. And what we were doing within the mix was breaking really new ground. So it was a, it, that's kind of the sweet spot for me of what I love to do as an entrepreneur is find and discover new things and, and take them to the world. And, and that's the thing that I, as an entrepreneur, love so much about In The Mix is because it's constantly evolving and it has integrity. Amma Van Buren said at EMC last year that of all the online digital medias that he reads, uh, in the mix has the most integrity and has the best information. So congratulations! And for anyone that is trying to understand uh, EDM, uh, go to In the Mix and check it out because it really does have the best content uh, of of all the online platforms that I've engaged as someone who is in the industry. So one thing that uh, people who don't understand what's happening in electronic dance music constantly say to me is. It came from nowhere. EDM came from nowhere, and uh, we all know that that's not true. Uh, but the same as like when people say it, they were, you know, X artist was an overnight success. It's ten years in the making when someone's an overnight success. So Matt, why don't you tell us uh, the twenty-five years that it took for for EDM to become an overnight success? Well. I guess the word EDM has been an overnight success, to say the least. Um, since most of my time in, in dance music, I hadn't heard that. Although there was something similar in, in the 90s, uh, um, IDM, intelligent dance music, which I also found weirdly offensive. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, elect electronic dance music as we know it today uh, stems from the arrangement styles of James Brown. Uh, and the machines that were invented by Roland and Roger Lynn and Casio and other companies like that in the late 70s and early 80s. And at the same time, really, hip-hop, techno, and house, and electro all started happening in different parts of the world uh, using similar technology and similar arrangement techniques but using very different sounds and, and targeting a different mood and a different energy. Mm -hmm. And what we're, I believe we're experiencing today is that that subculture was so profound that it never went away. There's always been a big dance music market. It's always been an incredible, in, incredibly important part of the lives of the people who are engaged in it. It's always been creating transcendental experiences. But what's changed 
is the confluence of the internet, uh, the festival market, and I think most significantly the ability of aspirational musicians to participate. Uh, punk rock was meaningful because everyone who saw the Ramones or the Sex Pistols thought, hey, I should go start a band. I have something to say and I can go do that. And before uh, this generation of technology, frankly, it was still pretty difficult to plug in, manage, and operate uh, digital music making equipment. So that confluence of technology, where the market has been, uh, and what young people I think are looking for right now is what has driven it to where it is today. And do you think that whole, like, how important is that whole plur thing? Um, it, because it was there in the beginning and, and I don't think it went anywhere. I really think that it's at the core of everything that is still around today and we'll talk more about that later but do you believe that it's, it's a core part of it? It is for me. I try not to tell other people what, how it should be and I, I need to remind myself that I'm a generation removed from the kids who are really driving the community today and should be driving the community today. Uh, so, I, I would not try to define it. However, and, and Neil knows this about me, I am an unrepentant hippie and had dreadlocks to the middle of my back and giant green pants during my raver days. Oh, please send me a photo. <laughs> there are human far between. For anyone who doesn't know what plur is, peace, love, unity, and respect. Uh, and uh, tell us about that. That was on on brochures, wasn't it? When when you guys were promoting gigs back in Chicago uh, in the yeah, early days. I don't remember who coined it, but it you know it used to used to say peace, love, unity, and respect on a lot of the flyers, and it had sort of a hippie retro vibe to it, I suppose. But I also don't know how you could possibly get together with a couple hundred of your close friends, take ecstasy, listen to great music, and not feel that way. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Neil, with, with regards to the last 25 years of dance music or EDM, uh, for whatever we want to coin it, there were a couple of times when it came really close to hitting and then didn't happen. And then it would come again close to hitting and everyone thought this is going to be the time of the DJ and the producer and then again it would back off. Why now? Why has it happened now? Well, firstly, I think <clears throat> to be really clear, the, the happening, if you like, now it has really been more of a kind of North American happening and potentially a little bit of an Asian happening. Mm -hmm. um, there's, been, there's been kind of waves of of dance music, and I'm going to call it dance music for the rest of this. Um, if we're talking about the last 25 years, let's call it dance music. Okay, fair enough. Um, and if we're talking about the last five minutes, we'll say EDM. EDM, yeah. fair enough. That's that's a great differentiating factor. <laughs> so, so uh, in my mind, there's there's kind of been there's kind of been a few different waves. And um, speaking from my personal experience, the UK went through went through a pretty pretty big wave there in the in the late 80s and 90s um, that when I came to Australia uh, in 98 that wave kind of arrived here and, and, and had a pretty has had a pretty good run since then and then, and then the new wave of EDM has come through in perhaps the last four or five years that's really taken on North America and now we're actually seeing a, a, a bigger uh, a, another wave not a big wave but another kind of um, explosion of interest in, in Asia um, mm. in areas like India and, and Korea and, and China and places like that. So I think it's, I think the business world, if you like, um, and the, 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 I suppose the more general view of, of popular culture has kind of woken up to EDM, which is, you know, America drives popular culture and, and, and until, until America's woken up to something, it isn't necessarily popular culture uh, on a global level. And that that's a very recent thing, but I think these these other waves have been happening, and you know there's the the the, the curves will happen and, and then um, peter off a little bit and pick up again. So I think the way I kind of think of it is that the the UK is probably is very mature in its in its curve, um, and has broken off into many different subgenres and uh, and lots of different pockets. 
I think Australia is probably just over the tip of its curve in terms of the, uh, the hysteria and popularity around it. And uh, I think the US is, is probably uh, um, on the other side. It's, it's not at the top yet, but it's probably not that far off. And I think Asia is, is much earlier on. I don't know if you agree with that, Matt, but that's kind of my view of where the world would be at right now. What well, Neil, have? I think I, Neil, I think you you likely have a, a really wise total view of it. Uh, but my experience online is that we're seeing growth all over the world, and that actually yeah. was a pleasant surprise to me over the last five years. Uh, you know, for years I've been traveling the world. I'm very lucky, and I get in a cab out of an airport in you know anywhere in Europe, and you're hearing house music or techno or some derivative form in any cab driver's car. That mm -hmm. that would that never happened in the United States uh, yeah. until recently. But on the internet, the the amount of traffic growth and interest in this community has been growing steadily, I've seen, all over the world in, in, in equal parts. Uh, and what that tells me is that the millennial generation is literally growing into their digital lives with electronic dance music being a part of it. I think my, my reference point was more about its, its position in popular culture and you know, relative to other things, it's, it's kind of its impact on popular culture, I think. Is, um, uh, less so its engagement with young people. I totally agree that, that in Europe it's, it's, it's as relevant, if not more relevant, than it's ever been. Um, but I think in terms of um, you know, having, having someone who's not part of the culture be aware of it in those areas, it's, it's yeah. certainly, certainly really exploded a lot. Oh, yeah. My dad can call me now and say, hey, I just heard about Avicii. You know, wasn't he popular on Beatport? And I'm like, awesome, Dad. Yeah, yeah. that's... That must be cool for you to see that. Kind of scary for me for my dad to think I have a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fact that your dad's like totally digging Avicii says a whole bunch of stuff. My dad introduced me to the Talking Heads uh, in 1977 when I was very young. He's forgiven for everything that he does after that moment. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So. We're starting to see that uh, there's growth in the way that the audience are accepting EDM. As an artist who was releasing in rock and alternative rock, I've been in music for 10 years. And so to then change the genre that I started releasing in uh, four years ago to dance music, electronic dance music, whatever you want to call it, um, I noticed that there was a, a shift in the way that people were receptive to that. And, and we're going to talk about audiences a little more in, in a few minutes, but I'm going to talk about artists. I want to talk about why it's so appealing, why EDM is so appealing to artists that are coming into music business. Uh, Matt, Matt, tell us why you believe that that is. Why, why is it that more artists than ever are gravitating towards EDM than they are to traditional bands? Well, I can't speak for the entire planet, but I can say that in, in the United States we've basically given up on public education in music and the arts. And so we don't have a, a, a public system for teaching people how to play music in schools which usually would be like the marching band or traditional instruments. Mm -hmm. But human beings have a, an innate desire and a human right to create and express. And uh, when the US first gave up on uh, musical education, kids learned to make music with their turntables. Mm -hmm. And that you know, hip hop really, I believe, came from a lack of people's access to traditional music models and people's humane, human desire to make music, period, with whatever they have. Yep. And people make music now with you know, whatever they have. And what every family has, uh, in almost every socioeconomic background um, in, the United States, in the United States, except the people going through the most difficult times, is a laptop mm -hmm. or some sort of computer in the home, or you have access to it at school. And with free software, you can make music. You can self-express to your community. And that's why uh, I believe 
young people are you know, gravitating towards this medium so much in terms of being creative. And then what's going to happen is over time they're going to use those tools to make things that give them a deep connection to either themselves or their audience. You said at EMC last year, um, you said that the laptop is the new guitar. It you, is. You, what I, what I meant, why. sure, what I meant was that when a kid wants to self-express through music, a young person, or even someone like me, they always use the tools available, and the guitar used to be the item that you could get relatively inexpensively at a five and dime store. The instruction manual, if you will, was relatively simple to learn to play a few car chords. And you could join the Sex Pistols if you were Sid Vicious after doing that for about 15 minutes. And uh, now, as we all know, you can do that with uh, digital tools. It doesn't mean you can do it well. It doesn't mean you deserve to be famous. But we all know that you can get started with a relatively low barrier to entry. And I think uh, creative people search that out. You, you have to start somewhere. So they're going to start with the laptop. Kids are going to want access to digital devices. And actually, I might rephrase that now. It's the death of the guitar and uh, the beginning of the phone, really, as the primary uh, social communicating tool. Mm. And iPads, the like? Yeah, just devices, just crappy plug-in, I guess. Do you, do you agree with that, Neil? Yeah, I think... I think um the impact of technology on, on music, how people create music, the accessibility of that, and not just how you create it, but how easy it is to distribute it, I think is the biggest game changer on music. And so um, it's that kind of instant feedback loop. It's this idea that you can be, you know, a kid somewhere with your laptop in your bedroom and, and then you can, you can launch your music to the world. Um, and all those layers and all those different kind of middlemen and... and, and and uh, channels and distribution methods have all been leveled out. And, mm -hmm. um, and now to you with your internet connection and some basic software and just an idea and some talent. And some people would argue that that just means that you know, there, there's a whole bunch of shit music out there. And to a degree, that's true. But uh, there's also, to, to Matt's point, there would have been a whole bunch of shit guitar players out there as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, uh, you know, all of this music's out there, and I, I still really believe that the cream rises to the top. And um, so, accessibility to, to the technology to create the music and the means to distribute it, um, uh, everyone has access to that. Not everyone has talent, not everyone has desire, and everyone has commitment and passion and focus and, and energy and, and assistance. And they're, they're the things that you need to be able to rise up. And I think now there's just an incredible amount of music out there, not just electronic music, but all music coming through these distribution methods. And, um, and the cream does rise to the top. I think that's absolutely fascinating and very, very exciting. You, uh, as a marketer, I can understand why you, <laughs> why you chew all that stuff up and, and enjoy that. We're going to talk about that music discovery um, and, and the changes that YouTube are making and the changes that SoundCloud uh, have introduced over the last few weeks in a minute. but. Tom Petty uh, came out last week because he's promoting an album and he wants to cause some, some controversy and he said a few things. Um, he said, watch people play records, that's stupid. You couldn't pay me to go. I'm, I don't think I'm oversimplifying it. That's what's going on. I don't think it would be any fun without the drugs. It's a drug party. Who's Tom Petty? Who's Tom Petty? <laughs> no, seriously, that's what. That, if you, if I think, you ask I think a twenty-one-year-old kid, Wilburys. <laughs> if you asked a twenty-one-year-old kid who was into EDM, what they thought of this, that's what they would say. Yeah, I I think that absolutely answers the question. <laughs> I mean, and and I never thought about it that way. Uh, I never thought a twenty-one-year-old is going to turn around and go, "Who the fuck is Tom Petty?" Yeah. Um, and fair enough. <laughs> now let's talk about music discovery. SoundCloud. SoundCloud have made some major shifts uh, by giving labels the access 
to take down music that hasn't been licensed correctly. Now, the reason this is a big deal for anybody who doesn't understand how SoundCloud fits, actually, I might let you, Neil, take this. Explain to us how, how SoundCloud fits into the EDM business model at the moment. Um, it's interesting. We, we did a, a, a big piece of research based out of the US uh, last year uh, in December. And, it, and to our knowledge, it was the, the biggest piece of, of EDM research that had ever been done. And we spoke to, I think it was 4,000 kids across New York, uh, LA, and Miami, and, um, and, and, and online as well. Um, so across the whole of the whole of the United States, and we really dug into music discovery to try and get our, our heads around what's happening there. And, and by far and away, SoundCloud was was the the strongest and, and most recognised and most widely used discovery source for for the audience that we were talking to. So within EDM, SoundCloud is is really really important, uh, and it's where people go to discover tracks. There are lots of other places and, and there is quite a long tail on that. But um, they really did stand out as being uh, as being the strongest. So from a from a, a music fan's point of view, it's it's an incredible platform for discovering new music and it's very vibrant and you know there's there's just so much stuff on there. It's you know it's like a kid in the candy store kind of uh, environment. Uh, for artists I think you know knowing that I think that it's, it's an absolutely pivotal, critical tool for them to have, and and um, and uh, I think it's just become a, a a key part of the process of, of, of becoming discovered as an artist and and um, and getting your music out there. There are lots of other channels like that as well, but but I think at the moment SoundCloud, particularly within electronic dance music, is is uh, is the one. And so SoundCloud have given the majors access to take uh, take music down. Matthew, how do you see this is going to affect the way that SoundCloud is being used by producers and DJs to showcase their talents and get their new music out there so quickly? Well, to be fair to SoundCloud, it's not that they've given you know their house keys to yeah. uh, some giant conglomerate. SoundCloud is obligated by law, at least in the United States and in certainly giant charts parts of Europe, that when they receive a complaint from a copyright owner that says someone is displaying content that I actually own, you're supposed to take it down. YouTube follows the same rules. SoundCloud follows the same rules. Now we're all familiar with websites that don't do that, but that's because they're so small that you know the people who own or represent Cascades music or the Beatles music can't go and find everybody who mm -hmm. may be benefiting from the use of the music that was created by someone who deserves to be part of the benefit chain of the use of that music. And so what SoundCloud has done as they've gotten larger is uh, received more and more legal compliance notifications from copyright holders that say, hey, I own that Beatles music, and somebody doesn't have the right to make a disco edit out of it. Please take it down. Now, there are some rights holders that are leaving stuff up because they believe that that has promotional value. And just like YouTube, I believe we'll see an evolution of rights holders allowing for more and more of that kind of usage on networks so long as they're allowed to make some money from it. If there's advertising on the page or if there's a subscription service tied to it, it's really important that the people who made the music get to participate in the value creation of it. We happen to work in a medium that uh, relies uh, frequently on derivative works. A derivative work is a piece of art where you start with all of or some of someone else's piece of art and you make something new of it. Uh, sampling um, you know, of the Broadway soundtrack to chess and then turning it into a great dance floor stomper uh, requires a license mm -hmm. and to do that. And that way the guy who wrote the song from chess gets to participate in his song being reused in this new business and, and that's fair. On um, the internet, 
uh, myself included, lots of us like to make things that we're not really licensed to distribute. We are licensed to make it for ourselves. We're always, all of us as creative people should be free to make and are free to make everything we want for ourselves. The complexity becomes when there's a business distributing it. And in this case, it's SoundCloud. So we're just seeing the natural evolution of a business. But the challenge for our community is that DJ mixes are, by their very nature, not licensed. Uh, a DJ doesn't necessarily have the right to redistribute all that music. Even a great DJ who's fully creating and making something new, a legitimately new tapestry out of pre-existing work, doesn't necessarily have the automatic right to distribute that online. And we're seeing that market evolve. I hope there are better solutions in the future. Why, <clears throat> excuse me, why is it that this industry, having, having come from rock where everyone tries to at least understand what copyright law is about and respects the fact that if you need derivative licenses, you go get derivative licenses, etc., etc., why is it that this particular part of the, the music business has had uh, has totally disregarded. I mean, I had a I had a Twitter argument with a guy who went off at SoundCloud about the fact that they took down a bunch of his songs. And when I said to him, you know, fancy that that you should actually be held accountable for getting, you know, for copyright breach, he said, but that's just not the way we do it in EDM. Why why is that attitude there? Where did that come from, Matt? Well. There's no, there is no doubt that copyright law is bloated and skews in the favor of large corporations. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also no doubt that the internet has confused a lot of young people about what the, the law is or the ethical thing is to do with other people's work. But all of us, and myself included, once we're given the tools to create something, it is our human nature to share that communication with other people. Yep. The creation of derivative works is a, a natural phenomenon like air. And I personally think bitching about it is uh, like complaining about the weather. It, it, you don't have any control over it. It happens. Na it's a natural occurrence. Um, what, what I'd like to see is uh, processes on the internet that allow people to be creative and allow the people involved in a creative chain to participate appropriately. And I think SoundCloud and YouTube and some new services coming online are going to be able to do that. Do you, Neil, do you think that if these limitations are placed on SoundCloud that artists are going to go elsewhere? Um, <clears throat> maybe, potentially. Uh, I still feel like the, the, the momentum is there and uh, I think they will uh, they will come up with better ways of doing this and, and as the models evolve, uh, more people are looking at the problem, throwing more resources at the problem, uh, that either SoundCloud or, or others will figure out better ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there is potential that, that, that people could move on from there. Um, I still think as a platform it's, you know, it's, it's an incredible way of and finding and, and, and discovering artists and engaging with artists and, and, and um, keeping up to date on everything that's going on, everything that's going to change in the near term. Um, I, I really think that in this case it's, it's uh, you know, bringing it back to the guy, that, the 21-year-old guy who says, who the fuck is Tom Petty? I don't think he's sitting around thinking about how um, some big rights holder is going to solve his problem about putting music up. You know, somebody yeah. may pull down their, their track from SoundCloud and they go, what the fuck, and then they move on. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a business problem to solve. It's yeah. a technology problem. It's not the 21-year-old kid's problem. He, he probably doesn't care too much. And uh, if it starts to, to infringe on his ability to share his art form, then maybe he'll go somewhere else. Yeah. Let's, um, let's talk about the way that music is made in EDM. The one, sh the big shift that I found coming from rock, being in big studios, uh, making EPs and, and albums with a team, 
uh, really experiencing that creative vibe with a bunch of people and then deciding that I was going to release an album in electronic dance music and all of a sudden I found that there was nobody in the room with me. I created a whole album uh, with the producer in a whole other country. This was a mind fuck for me and, and very exciting, really, really exciting that you didn't have to go and spend a whole bunch of money on a studio, etc, etc. And one thing that I am constantly hearing from artists now because we speak a lot about building your network on the Music Spring. We hear a lot of producers in EDM say, I feel really isolated. Talk to us, Matt, about the, I guess, the effect of isolation on an entrepreneur's ability in EDM to create their network and any limitations that you think that that might present. Well, I think, I think any isolation you sense in, in this particular markets, creative community is, is really more a symptom of isolation in the digital age. Yeah. Um, we spend more time physically alone uh, or engaged with people through intermediaries. Uh, that is a function of life today. Mm -hmm. And uh, dance music creation is no different. I actually think one of the reasons that dance music is so perfect for right now is that the, the manner in which uh, digital audio workstations uh, and MIDI technology function uh, are really great, uh, create great, really great files that you can share on the internet really easily with your co-producer uh, so that you can both be working on uh, the same piece of music um, in some cases in real time mm. uh, together. And so uh, digital both physically alienates us and mentally brings us together. Uh, uh, at the same time. So what, what I, I like to read the Reddit user group for beginning producers because I've been hobby producing for 10 years and I'm still terrible. And so <laughs> I, li I like to read all the, the young guys and gals their questions and seeing the answers people post in Reddit because most of the time it's a question I probably had to. And uh, you know that generation of kid I don't think they feel isolated at all, and mm -hmm. judging by the, the, the board I'm on on Reddit, it's an extremely lively, complex, and I think healthy communication medium that, that I'm witnessing um, that probably brings a lot of people together. You know, when I was in dance music way back in the late 80s and early 90s, if you lived in rural Alaska, Mm -hmm. and someone brought you a Derek Carter mixtape from Chicago, and that's all you had, and it blew your mind. You had no other way to access it. Yeah. You had no other way to try to make it yourself. You had no other way to find out if there were other people who liked it. That, that is an incredible change today, and so especially for people who live in far-flung far -flung places, I would say they are infinitely more collaborative and integrated with the rest of the world than they were 10 years ago. Whereas people who live in congested cities are probably now spending more time in private by themselves communicating with those people far, far away. Do you, Neil, do you think that the fact that people are, like Matt said, that they're isolated but they're connected, do you think that the festival uh, market is a really, is why it's so successful because people are going there and being physically connected? They're there in a group together and connected around this music that they all love. Do you think that that plays a role? Yeah, so so again, we looked at this in the research that we did, and, and this is this is true for the American market, but I would say it's, it's probably true globally. The, um, the EDM experience for a fan, um, it, it comprises lots of different elements, but the, the, the live experience of experience EDM as a group, as a collective, um, is a core part of what it's all about and a core part of its success. So, you know, the, the, there's the DJ um, and there's the drop within the track. There's the production and the staging and the lighting and all of that is a really key component of it. And then there's a sense of community that you get from being in this environment. 
um, of like-minded people, the player that we talked about, mm -hmm. um, and, and this connection that you have, this collective connection that you have as a group. And they're all the, 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 the elements of the formula of why EDM is so powerful um, and, and has the ability to, to, to really impact young people today. That's, that's what makes the experience. So I think the live experience is, is the real game changer. Uh, there's obviously a community of, of people that are creating the music and, um, and sharing, distributing the music and, and um, co-producing, collaborating with people in different countries and different time zones and all that kind of stuff. But really the, the sweet spot is when you actually get to play that in front of a, a big crowd or even a small crowd. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I, I discovered dance music by accident. Uh, coming from rock, I listened to techno when I was a kid and experienced techno as a kid and there was a big gap for me, uh, a big time gap and decided I was going to make, <clears throat> excuse me, an album about my identity and decided I couldn't do that from a reference point that made me comfortable so I decided I was going to make an EDM album. I didn't go to parties, I didn't go to raves, I didn't go to festivals or anything, I was just exploring the music and the one thing that I found was that this music took me to a whole new level. No drugs, nothing. This music was transcendental just from a music perspective. Then when I did start going to, to festivals and, and above and beyond was my first EDM experience. I was in a room with 10,000 other people and I'd never experienced anything like this. This was, it was mind altering for me and I hadn't had anything. And that's when I realized there's something important about the group experience in going to a festival, going to a party where there's electronic dance music. You, everyone that talks about you have to be on drugs in order to do it, that's a lot of shit. Um, I'm clean, I've, I don't take drugs and it's, it is transcendental. The DJ is God though. The DJ at these festivals is worshipped uh, and that's very attractive to a lot of, of artists that are out there. Uh, it's the opportunity that they get to play other people's music or their own music and are worshipped by tens of thousands of people. I, I know that there are a lot of DJs that are watching this so we need to talk about how they create that experience for themselves. Neil, how do people start DJing and end up playing Stereosonic? What's, what's a way that they get to, to affect people, a group of people's lives like that? Oh, it's, it's hugely varied. I mean, there's some, there's some great stories of uh, that, that journey being um, expressed, accelerated. In, in recent years, and um, I, I was uh, I watched an interview the other day with Porter Robinson talking about how he he felt that um, he had the ability to 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 create all of this this great music and and from a different perspective because he wasn't old enough to get into a nightclub, so he'd never actually experienced um, a festival or a club, and so his perspective and his take on it and he, and how he heard the music and interpreted it and, and then. Really his own was, was very, very different. It's just coming from a different angle. I think we're seeing more of that now. Um, I think the, the 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 journey of of an artist, of a DJ like Carl Cox or something like that, would have been completely different to what mm. you would see from you know from Martin Garrett or Paul Robinson or any of the young kids that are coming through today. And I think that is is what we talked about: is the technology and the distribution um, and just the the, the sheer scale of the industry now is looking for that new talent and supporting and bringing that talent through and being able to immediately amplify it and, and make it make something of it um, is, is now a big global industry the scene behind that was you know the DJs from from the, the 80s and early 90s were just doing it out of love and playing in small rooms and driving around in their car up and down the, the M1 in London and and, uh, and building a fan base the, the old way you know by pounding the pavement and, and, and making real connections with fans that, they weren't able to build their fan base digitally. So it has changed a huge amount. Um, I still think, though, that as an artist, you do need to make those localized connections. You have to go out there and meet people face to face, and, and, uh, um, and there has to be a strong human element to what you're doing, and that's how people discover uh, your personality as well as your sound, and you, you collaborate and, and, and 
form different collectives and different groups and, and you get to see and, and, and feel how people experience your music. I think that's still a very, very important part of it. But it has changed. And and is it a tiered approach? Like should should young DJs that are, are watching this that do have the vision of I want to play stereo sonic one day. Is it, a, is it the idea that they need to put together a plan that's a tiered approach behind their social media strategy as well as their live performance as well as maybe their, so, their SoundCloud approach? Is it, is it that or will they achieve what they need to achieve just by getting out there and playing the clubs? And, well, and I think all of, those, all of those elements are important to understand how it's part of your, your, your thinking, but at the end of the day it's the the creativity that's the most important part and your ability to, to produce good music and to perform. Um, there, there are some other interesting examples. There's, a, um, there's an event here in Australia called Your Shop. That's on at been, the moment. Yeah, just it's been finished, running, yeah. yeah, it's been running for probably four or five years now. And the model behind Your Shop is that you don't have to be able to DJ or produce or have any experience whatsoever. You go along uh, to an audition. Uh, if you like, and there's you know there's probably a thousand, a couple of thousand kids there, and um, you just they're looking for people that are really passionate and really want to learn and really want to discover, and then they send you on a course uh, for a couple of months, and they they train you up to to DJ and to produce and to perform, and they teach you about social media and they teach you about all these tools and elements, and they they skill you up to become an artist, and there's actually been a couple of artists that have come through that process who are now doing incredibly well, um, which I think is just, you know, incredible, a, a really fascinating uh, thing that um, there are um, structures now that exist that are able to facilitate and support that kind of um, emergence and discovery, which, you know, frankly weren't there 10, 15 years ago. With, with regards to breaking artists, your shot is a great example of how that's developing in Australia. I get asked, Matt, about Beatport a lot. Um, I get I get uh, I get comments from artists saying "fuck Beatport" because uh, everyone who who is on the top ten in Beatport has to buy their way in there. Can you talk about that? Well, I can't talk about Beatport specifically, except what any of you could Google. And yeah. Lloyd Starr, the awesome uh, president of Beatport, uh, who I work with during my time there and is the last remaining first employee of Beatport and a good friend, recently made a statement in Billboard about the technology and techniques Beatport uses to prevent that kind of thing. And I mm -hmm. think his direct quote, and I am a big fan of Lloyd Starr, was, fuck those guys. And everyone's aware that there are companies out there advertising that they can attempt to do that for you. There are mm -hmm. also companies out there that will help you fake your SoundCloud plays, yep. your Facebook plays, your YouTube plays. I'm sure there's a company out there that will pretend to call you and pretend to be your mom so that you feel loved too. Um, Give me their number. Yeah, yeah, can I have her number? Their, okay. their number? <laughs> and, uh, I think that People are often presume that a record they don't like bought its way into yeah. the chart position of anything, of SoundCloud, of YouTube, or Beatport. Um, and I can tell you from my experience, usually it's not the case. Usually it's just a, a shitty record that got really popular. Um, all of us in the industry, uh, in digital, are really committed to being transparent around What's really popular? You know, in the old days, the Billboard chart was not re a real reflection of what was popular. Yeah. They would call people all over the country and say, what's popular? And the guy sitting there at the desk would make shit up. <laughs> um, and so now we're in a much better place where uh, the servers are connected to a system that's doing an algorithm that's fairly deciding the popularity and the reach of something. And then there are people developing software to break those systems. It's going to be a cat and mouse game forever. Um, I certainly understand why people might feel fuck Beatport or fuck YouTube or fuck TrackSource um, when they haven't been successful or haven't what they 
gotten what they wanted. That's a common internet theme. Um, and and Bport has a particular audience, and Track Source has a particular audience, and uh, Track It Down has a particular audience. And you know there there are new services coming online all the time. And if you're confident that what you've made is worthwhile, it you can go find that audience. It doesn't yep. mean necessarily go find the wrong audience. And so if you haven't had success on one platform, it doesn't mean that the another platform might not be where your people are. Yeah. And and if Beatport getting on the top ten of Beatport is your focus as an artist, uh, it's not going to happen with your first track. It may, but it's very rare. Like build a plan, put a strategy together, and and connect with the right labels, the right people that are going to help you and support your career through that. Understand that you're going to have to have every artist in today's music model must go through a DIY phase. When, uh, you know, when I was growing up working in dance music when vinyl was the business, going into the vinyl shop in town, a heavy week, a heavy week of new releases, you know, in-house and in techno, the area I went to, would be a hundred new pieces of vinyl. Wow. Uh, there are more than 25 or 30,000 commercially released electronic dance music records every week now. And that's not counting the free ones that are given away, and I would imagine there's got to be thousands. four, five, ten, a oh, thousand yeah. times more than that. Um, so there's a lot to sort through. We are quickly running out of time, and I haven't even come close to covering 50% uh, of what I wanted to ask you. But some of our Patreon backers have some questions, and this one comes from Ross Barber, who is uh, Electric Kiwi on Twitter. And he said, I'd be interested to hear what their views on different methods of promo and marketing for different genres are. Obviously, every artist is different, but are there specific things that work better for specific genres, and are there any specific approaches that are more likely to work for an artist in the EDM genre versus rock genres, for example. Who would like to take that question, gentlemen? Neil? Sure, why not? <clears throat> um, I think there are nuances and differences. Um, I, I think just the nature of, of playing in a band um, makes makes the process different. Uh, you know, the, the process of creating the music and being in the studio and recording and, and then getting it out there is, is, is still a little bit different, I think. I think, I think there's a, uh, the path to distribution um, and getting your music out there uh, through electronic music is, is probably a little bit simpler, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but I still think the same principles and the same rules apply. Once you get to that point where you've got your music and you want to reach your audience, you still need um, you need to follow uh, you know, a very similar formula, I would say. And, and, and once you reach that stage where you, you are starting to, to build a fan base and you may, you may be lucky enough to, to be able to bring on board a manager or a publicist or sign with a record label or, or have your music um, distribute those kind of things, I think is, uh, the process starts to become quite similar uh, regardless of the genre that you're putting out there. Um, there'll be you know, obvious nuances in terms of where you're targeting your, your message and your PR and all those kind of things, but I think it is, to, to a certain extent, a tried and tested formula. There are, there are different things in electronic music like Beatport and uh, SoundCloud and those types of things that I think are part of the process. Um, if, you're, if you're in electronic dance music versus what you might do in indie or in rock or those other areas, but I, I, I feel like it's you're going to reach a point where it's, it's the same model and the same approach that you would take, the same dream team that you would want to assemble um, functionally. Anyway. Neil, are you of the opinion that artists need to stop looking at themselves as genre specific and start looking at themselves as entrepreneurs? Do you agree with that? I, I mean, I, I love the music industry for the fact that it is um, all of these these um, small entrepreneurs. You know, if you look at um, you know. Festival promoters um, mm. started out doing club shows, and you know they were uh, most of the festival promoters I know and know very well and friends with started out doing a party for 
200 of their friends when they were at high school, you know? And so the, the music industry by its very nature is, is made up of thousands of, of small, driven, focused people who, who just were very passionate about something and wanted to make a difference. And then that enabled them, you know, through luck or timing or persistence, and probably a combination of all of those, to break through and, and to be able to make a living out of doing what they're doing. It's the same with Ukraine music or being on the party or if you're um, you know, a street promoter or you're a publicist or you want to work in, in the media side, it's really, it is a, a, it's, it's a whole bunch of small entrepreneurs. And that, that brings its own challenges in that, that there's no, you know, in terms of professionalism and those kind of things, there's there's the, there's often a few speed bumps on the way through and there's there's no, um, uh, no defined way of breaking through. But I think that's what makes it so exciting is that you can, you can have a crack at it and there is a chance um, that you can break through and and, um, and you can learn on the way through. And I, I think that's what makes the music industry so vibrant and so exciting. I agree with you. I think that there's never been a more exciting time to be in the music industry. And for anyone who is looking at getting into, into EDM or any other genre, it's innovation that's going to separate you out and help your, you know, the cream rise to the top. Uh, really, really great music is important, but unfortunately it's not the be-all and end-all. Uh, in, in the way that the new music campaign is, uh, the new music industry is evolving. It's important and keep working at your craft, but innovation uh, in entrepreneurship is what is go. It makes this industry so fucking exciting. Um, and I'm really proud to be a part of, of where the industry is going right now. Um, so I'm going to give you this one, Matt. Uh, do you feel that EDM has become as big as it, is, as it has become because of touring economics. I've heard of DJs who tour with just a USB stick. Uh, well, you just made, you made a, asked a question and made a statement right afterwards, and I have to divorce those two things. OK. Uh, uh, yes, one of the reasons our market has grown as a business is that the traditional music market is broken in mm -hmm. innumerable ways. And there are some things about uh, even bringing a live uh, PA, um, you know, or a DJ uh, is less expensive to bring them around the world than bringing a band around on a bus. So th I wouldn't say that that's it's just simply an advantage our market has over you know lugging, you know, I don't know Pearl Jam around uh, yeah. and how expensive that must be. I don't think there's anything wrong. I want to be clear. Chuck Berry tours with nothing. You show, you you bring him a guitar, you bring him a mic, you bring him the other musicians who play with him that night. He doesn't rehearse with him, and he's still freaking Chuck Berry. So if he wants to show up with a USB stick, he's still Chuck Berry, um, if that's all you need. Um, and ultimately, DJs will bring nothing because the content they use – oh, I'm sorry. I hate the word content. It sounds like I'm shoveling manure into a pickup truck. The music they use <laughs> – is going to be in the cloud, and they'll access it through the device that has been pre-rented for them, you know, on site. So I, I don't really care how much stuff you have to load around, uh, but uh, there is no doubt that the efficiency with which people who create in our market can physically move around is a benefit. Steve Aoki, mm -hmm. Eric Carter. Uh, Claude Von Stroke, they can play Detroit one night and um, South Africa, well, I guess a night and a half later or something like that. But you get my point. Yeah. Um, that's just not possible if you have to tear down a giant construction set. That's not possible if you have 400 people to move. That's not possible if you have to do Lady Gaga's hair on the way there. Yeah. And and so there there are efficiencies in the market that are you know that are good for business and. Uh, right now, the business growing is bringing this music to more people. And Neil, is that is that why the festival market is exploding? Because it is so much more economical and more efficient to get the talent in and out as quickly as you can? Do you think? No, I think the festival market is exploding because kids love dance music. That's, that's the reason why. Um, it may be more profitable to do a dance festival than a, than a rock festival, 
for those those reasons. Um, but then I would argue at the same time that the amount of money that's been spent on production, um, you know, uh, outweighs what you probably would have spent on on uh, lugging around mm. music equipment. So um, I think you know the DJ themselves may turn up with a USB stick or plug into the cloud, but more often than not, what you're seeing now is these huge elaborate productions that might follow Steve Aoki or might follow uh, Tiesto or Dead Mouse when they're going around with them. Everyone's got a, a prism or a pyramid or a something or other. The, or a triangle of some sort. Yeah. There's, some, there's some kind of um, three-dimensional shape following a DJ around somewhere. So uh, I, hope, I hope that the arm market isn't only, and our community isn't only about the festival market. Yeah. You know, there have always been traveling circuses. Uh, in the United States, we call them the county fair. And I remember I went to a county fair in Wisconsin one day, and I saw a two-headed cow and Andy Gibb perform on the same Fuck. day. The same place. <laughs> it was a great day. And, and so there are always, there's always been and there will always be these big businesses of extremely large-scale human gatherings. Um, but great dance music, all it really requires is a speaker and you and one friend. Hmm. Do you guys see the, the festival market evolving back to and swinging the other way to it not being just about the DJ being God? Do you think that we, we will start to see uh, a collaboration on stage between bands and DJs? Is that how you, you see that evolving, uh, Matt? Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, I saw the bloody beat roots just kill it at Stereosonic as basically a live act, you know, a live band act. Uh, I don't personally care how sound gets to a speaker. I care that I'm standing in front of a speaker and that speaker is blowing my mind. Mm -hmm. Really, when I'm having that moment, I don't care if someone plagiarized 10 samples from someone else's record or if they're rocking a banjo on stage, because I'm not looking at the stage. I've never understood that. And uh, I'm, you know enjoying what comes out of the speaker regardless of how it got there. Yeah. Uh, but I also enjoy bands and jam bands and hippie bands and we'll see more and more bands incorporate this but that already happened once. We called it Manchester and I'm still a Stone Roses fan. <laughs> nice. Neil, do you think that, that it will swing that way? Do you believe that, that we'll start seeing uh, live music and DJs? I, I've never really seen it. Uh, in that way, I guess you know. I think it's always there's always been bands playing electronic music, and and um, I've seen that as a key. You know, the live element has always been an element that's, that's been there, and I think it will always be there moving forwards. Um, yeah, I, I don't see any great trend at the moment that I'm seeing in that area, either for or against live electronic music. I think it's just it just depends on the artist and what they're. How they express themselves, and there will always be there will always be bands like um, Empire of the Sun that want to want to perform yep. live, and there'll look there'll always be people like Calvin Harris who who uh, want to do their thing. So you know, it it just really depends on the artist. I don't think I think Matt's right. I think the fat the fan at the end of the day is is this good? Am I loving it or or not? And I don't think they care what. Uh, technology or equipment um, the eyes is using to convey that, that entertainment. Nice. The, uh, the question we get asked a lot is you can't call a DJ a musician. That's a comment we get a lot of. I want both of you to tell me what you think, how you would class a DJ. And we'll start with you, Neil. Would you class them as a musician, an artist or an entertainer? Uh, look, I think if you're going to talk about what would be a traditional, in a tr traditional sense, a disc jockey, which is someone who is is bringing together other people's music and um, and creating a tapestry of music, um, then that is that is an art form in of itself, and I think that that plays a really important role um, in reading the mood of. of the crowd and, and you know, there's, there's, there's no doubt there is an art to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's changing a lot now where you're starting to see that in order to be a DJ that's going to be on the main stage at a festival you have to have uh, a 
a large amount of your own productions to, to really break through into that area. There's only um, there's not many DJs left that are, that are pure DJs in, in that sense. Um, but I, I, you know, from my point of view, I, some of my best experiences, you know, going back to my very early experiences of dance music with, with um, people that were just incredible at reading and learning and could, could just build a mood and a vibe and, and, and just, just take you on a journey. And, and I think that that is... Um, they deserve to be called musicians. I, I, I don't care too much for, for labeling them either way. I just they, they made they moved me. They changed my life. And I had a fucking good time. That's all I care. Yeah, Carl Cox is a master of that, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. There are many. What about there are? What What do you think, Matt? What What would you? you... Know, I, I'm sure when someone invented the very first keyboard, which was before the harpsichord. Yeah. Previous musicians who had to find tonality on a string manually uh, felt that that was too much technology and it had made making music too easy because all of a sudden you could press a button and C would come out as opposed to having to find it on a string. Uh, so people who do one thing always complain that the people who do it another way aren't, aren't doing it right. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Neil. DJs are artists. Uh, some of them suck and some of them are awesome, but they're all trying to make art. And a, a great DJ can make a musical tapestry, but mm -hmm. that doesn't have to be the same as, as being a musician and making music. But if you're a producer making tracks, you're a musician. You just happen to be using the laptop as a, a creative medium. And one of the things that's hard for us people who like to use language and have words for things is the technology doesn't care what words we use. There's a great blending between what you can do with a piece of DJ hardware and software and what you can do with a digital audio workstation and that world is going to blend even further uh, mm -hmm. to the point where these differentiations aren't meaningful. What's meaningful is did someone make a piece of art that moved you? And I guess for anyone who doesn't agree with the idea that you know a DJ is an artist, look a DJ's job is to create a vibe amongst a group of people. Good DJs know how to finesse and play with that vibe and the emotions of the crowd to a point where they're, they're heightening their experience. Any fucking artist is responsible for doing that. That's that's your job as an artist. So yes, in that, in that perspective, I really believe that a DJ is an artist. So on that point, we have gone over time so I get to ask you your final question for the show. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Neil. What's the one decision that you would have made different in your music career? I think the thing that I um, learned very much the hard way is that any time I've tried to do something in my career where the primary objective has been to make money, I've failed quite miserably. Wow. And so um, I, think, I think my learning is that whatever I do moving forward, I have to be doing it because I'm really passionate about it and I'm really excited by it. Um, Primarily, that has to be the primary driver, and the financial benefit has to be secondary. Um, I'll give you an example. We uh, we had a uh, a foray into online ticketing. We we ran a ticketing company um, uh, five or six years ago, and it kind of came out in the mix. People uh, we thought you know as a revenue stream for us, we could sell tickets and in the mix, and it was it was really successful for a while. Um, and then we decided to spin it out as its own separate business and, and we decided to compete with all of the other ticketing companies and, and uh, we raised some money to go into the space and, and you know, it was about you know, being really good at the technology and being really good at, at, at acquiring new clients to sell tickets for our platform and I, I just frankly wasn't very passionate about it. It was just a way that we could make some more money. And it didn't work, and uh, it was very painful, and it was very difficult, and the process of going through failure was very, very hard. But I just made a decision at that point that whatever it is that I'm going to do now as an entrepreneur, um, money can't be the primary driver because it probably won't work. That's my learning. As an entrepreneur, are you finding that life is more, I guess, empowered because of that decision? Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, being an entrepreneur is hard. Very, very, very hard. There's, 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 uh, there's, 
there are so many moments where, where you just wonder why you're doing this yeah. and why is this so difficult and um, there is so much responsibility involved in it. Um, but it's also incredibly rewarding. So, you know, it's a trade-off. Um, and I, I think it's a lot harder to, to, to bounce out of bed in the morning and, and, um, and go the extra mile and put in the extra effort if your motivations are not right, if you're, mm. if you're, if you're not, if it's not coming from a place that, that really feels, um, that you feel really passionate about, if you're doing it for, for other reasons, then, then it, it just wears you down. You need to be coming from the right place. That was really inspiring. Thank you, Neil. Okay. Um, Matt, what's the one decision you would have made differently in your career? I don't know how I can possibly be as eloquent or as inspiring as, as Neil. Uh, and before this thing wraps up, let me just say one of the main reasons I was happy to appear on this show was because I don't see enough of Neil and I knew I would get to see him on, on my computer today. Uh, I have a lot of regrets. I think people who say they have no regrets are dangerous. Uh, but all of them, in the end, my regret is not listening to myself. Uh, I'm always right in my own head if I'm listening to myself. Yeah. It's not that I'm always right in what I say. It's not that I'm always right in what I do. But if I really could calm down and center myself in the past, uh, when I had major decisions to make that I wasn't happy with the decision I make, what I find out is, you know, I did know better. I knew what I was supposed to do, and I didn't listen mm -hmm. to myself. Be that... Uh, an opportunity to explore, a person I shouldn't trust, a dog I should adopt, all the good things and all the bad things, in, in hindsight, I, I knew well enough to know what was going to come. And uh, I try to listen to myself a lot more. And I guess particularly as creatives, we're in touch with that in intuition quite a, a significant amount more than, than people who aren't creative. And, oh, uh, I, I think that's a very, very generous thing to say of me. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> All entrepreneurs are creative. Who better to be entrepreneurs than creatives? I, I <laughs> think you were saying that suggesting I was symp sympathetic and empathetic. I'm not sure that's... <laughs> are you just a general asshole? Is that what you're trying to say? No, no, I'm just a human being doing the best I can. <laughs> nice. Guys, it has been such a pleasure to have you on the show today. Uh, I, th I think that we could have dug so much deeper, but we covered what we needed to cover to start a conversation about EDM and dance music. Uh, thank you for giving so generously of your information and of your experiences. Neil, have an amazing day in Sydney. Thank you. We have uh, the In The Mix Awards are on here in Sydney tonight, so we've got about 350 people coming to the Ivy Forum tonight to celebrate the best of Australian dance music. So I'm very excited. Fantastic. I hope you have an amazing time. Will do. Um, and, and Matt, Bigfoot, I hope, finds you very quickly or you find Bigfoot very quickly. Thank you very much. <laughs> and it's been a pleasure to have both of you guys. Peace, love and peanut butter. Thanks, Lee. Bye. Cheers, Matt. See you guys. Thank you for tuning in to Season 2, Episode 15 of The Music Spring. If you missed any of the episode, log on to YouTube after the show and watch this again. Check us out online. Search for The Music Spring on Facebook, Google+, YouTube, SoundCloud, or share on Twitter. Hashtag The Music Spring. To get involved, join the mailing list, or for more information on the presenters in this panel, log on to our website, themusicspring.com. The Music Spring is free and always will be, but if you like what we do and find the information informative, please consider supporting us on patreon.com forward slash themusicspring. Unfortunately, we won't be live next week as we take a little siesta, but we'll be back for episode 16 on the 20th of August as we present How to Plan a Tour. See you then.